First of all, I want to uh, thank you for welcoming me here uh, at St. Martin in the field. Um, I feel very much at home, very Catholic. Uh, you have your crucifix and your candles and your uh, uh, station of the cross and the image of Mary in the back. So I'm, I'm quite at home here. So thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate that very much. Uh, well, then, uh, Scott is over our parish preaching there, so I'm glad to be able to, to be here. We've been having this conversation uh, oh, for a couple months now, and it's been really wonderful uh, to have this uh, dialogue with each other. Uh, my name is, again, Father Richard. I am a Franciscan priest. I don't know if you know what that means, but I'll tell you what that means in, in a moment. But I'm following uh, St. Francis of Assisi. You remember that's that uh, birdbath priest. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, don't you? And uh, we're a little different than the diocesan priest. We take uh, three vows, and that's why you see the three knots here, okay? Uh, and they are uh, no money, no honey, and do what you're told. <laughs> Poverty, chastity, and obedience. That's how I have to live. Okay, so it uh, gives you a little bit of an introduction of, uh, of who I am. Uh, I'm glad to be able to preach today. It's, you know, the continuation of the, of the epiphany, the manifestation of Jesus as Lord and Savior, as also divine, and in his glory. And we have that uh, gospel today uh, in, 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 this, uh, in our readings. Now, I have a question for you, and think about this now. How would you define a good marriage and the best way? Because that's what we're talking about in the readings today. What is that? What is that like? What does that mean? How do we know what that's all about? Well, the scriptures really do help us in this regard. And I think that that's important for us to really delve into it deeply to understand what it is that uh, God wants of us. For starters, I think, we can say that uh, it all begins, we have to really begin with, where is God found? Where? Is God found just here in the church? Is God found in our family life? I hope so. Is God found in our marriages? Is God found in our individual lives of prayer? All of those are places where we find God. And it's important that even before marriage became a sacrament in the New Testament, there was a different kind of marriage. And we have to look at that. Where is the, the, the genesis of marriage? Where does it come from? Well, if we look at the Old Testament, we find it very clearly because there is a marriage that begins with God. Isn't that interesting? The marriage begins with God, not with people, with God first. And we see it very clearly because there is a relationship between God and his people. And we find that all throughout the Old Testament. How many times, if you go in the Old Testament and read I will be your God, and you will be my people. It's over and over and over again. That's the relationship that God has with his people. And indeed, what we have here is an understanding that God is married to his people. So before there was a marriage between two people, there was a marriage between God and all of his people. And I think we have to recognize that. That tells us something. That becomes the model. That becomes the pattern. That becomes the mirror of every marriage. And so we've got to look at that carefully. God is married to his people. There is a covenant bond of faithfulness <coughs> between God and his people. Now, you know as well as I do that it's very difficult sometimes to see that. And I think it's because too much, there's so much individualism in our uh, daily lives. And in the United States specifically, you know, and especially if you're a Texan. Oh, <laughs> you know, God forbid anybody would take away my personal rights about anything. <laughs> you know? So, you know, 
We so we, 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 we have to look at that. And I always tell my people, when you come into this community, when you're coming to this assembly, you leave your individualism at the door. It doesn't exist here. This is the assembly of God. This is the community of God's people. This is the body of Christ. So the community takes precedence over the individual. And that was what Jesus was trying to get across. That's what the Old Testament God tried to get across to us as well. Marriage is a community. It's a community by nature. There's got to be at least two people. And so, to understand that, in our tradition we say that uh, it is a community of life and love that, that marriage is. And so, to understand that helps us to see who we are as the people of God. All right? Who we are as the people of God. We have to understand, I think, clearly that all belongs to God. It doesn't belong to me. I frequently tell our people, you know, I've had more, I've gone to more funerals than any one of you had. Trust me. In my uh, 40 years of priesthood, I've been there. And I've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. You got it? You can't take it with you. And so, you, you know, it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. And when we begin to understand that, then we begin to understand even marriage. It belongs to God. It's His relationship with us. It's your relationship to each other. It's our relationship to each other as a community, as the body of Christ, as God's people. All belongs to God. And that means that regardless of our relationship to God, God will never, ever, ever abandon us. That is so consoling for me. Because there are some days when I have tough days, and I'll bet you do too. And I know that God is with me. I know that he's my constant companion, that he walks with me daily. And I need that because I wouldn't be able to get through some of the tough days that I have otherwise. And neither would you. And neither would your marriages. It's tough sometimes. It's interesting in the Old Testament, this marriage between God and his people is so strong and so vital that if there is an unfaithfulness to the one true God, and there was frequently unfaithfulness to the one true God, read the Old Testament. They're constantly going after some, some other gods. As soon as they get taken over by another country, whether it's the Assyrians or the Babylonians or anybody else, they start following the pagan gods again. Now that's ridiculous and it seems stupid to us, but that's what they did. So they were unfaithful. They were unfaithful to God. But you know what the scripture says in the Old Testament? That's idolatry because you're going after a false god. I am the only one true God, and you're going after someone else. But it's not only idolatry, because the same thing God calls this adultery. You're going after a false god. I'm married to you. Why are you going after that kind of a god? You see? So idolatry becomes adultery in the Old Testament. That's how strong the relationship is between God and his people. So no matter how many times they may be unfaithful, God will always remain faithful to them. Thank God for that. And he's always taking them back. Always taking them back. And so we see that in the Old Testament. We see that in our reading from the first, from uh, Isaiah, the third Isaiah prophet today. When he says basically that I espouse you as my people. You're no longer desolate. I mean, they were in, in uh, Babylonian exile for 50 to 70 years. And it may have seemed that they were abandoned by God. He says, I haven't abandoned you. I have espoused you. You will come back and you will be married to me again faithfully like you're supposed to be. So he keeps taking them back. Thank God he does. Otherwise, where would we be without it? <coughs> when we look at the gospel today, it is a very interesting gospel. It is a very interesting gospel because it's the wedding feast of Cana. 
But it's more than that. It's really the wedding feast of the church. It's the presence of the church that is important in this way. I think I have, do I have a, a half hour to preach? Is that right? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll keep going. <laughs> Somebody go like this when it's top. <laughs> the wedding feast of Cana is the wedding feast of the church. So just as the people were wedded to God, the church is wedded to God. And so we see that in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the New Testament too. It's interesting in this particular wedding, it should be good, but the bride and the groom are absolutely anonymous. We don't even know who they are. Not even mentioned. Not even mentioned by name. Who are mentioned by name? Jesus and his mother Mary. They are the only ones mentioned by name in the gospel. So we have something else going on here. This isn't just about the bride and the groom who didn't have enough wine. It's more than that. We see what happens. That Mary and Jesus step in for the bride and the groom. They step in for them. And they're there, why? To serve. They're there to serve the people. The bride and the groom who are there. They're serving them. We see it very clearly. And isn't that true of marriages? In our tradition, when we speak of marriage, it's a sacrament of service. You are serving one another as husband and wife. And so we have that also in the New Testament here. They are serving. Mary tells Jesus, there's no wine left. What do we do now? Sounds like an embarrassing thing for the anonymous bride and groom. But what does Jesus do? He begins something marvelous. He transforms the water into the wine. He transforms the water into the wine. In doing so, He's giving us the theme of this wedding. The theme of this wedding is transformation. He's doing something, changing something for us. So God calls us to a different kind of wedding, so to speak. There's no wine, but now there's an abundance of wine. And guess what? There are some other people there, not named, they're disciples. The disciples are the invited guests, just as we are the invited guests of the church. And as invited guests of the church, what does he do to them? He transforms them into believers. They see the glory of God. They see in this epiphany the manifestation of his divinity. That he could change that water into wine. And now he's changing them. They begin to see. He is more than just a simple prophet coming along the way, a simple wonder worker. He's more than that. He's divine. He's the divine son of God. He is the one who gives us new life and shows us his glory, who manifests himself to us in his divinity. That's what epiphany is all about. And so we have another transformation. Christ is the bridegroom of the church. Christ himself is now the bridegroom of the church. The disciples are his witnesses. You see, it's a marriage of the church with his people. God and the church. This is what we have in this wedding feast of Cana today. The disciples are not only believers now. These are the ones who will eventually become missionary disciples. And you know what missionary disciples are? They're evangelizers. They're people who are the apostles that go out and share the good news with others. That's true of every single one of us. When we are here in this church, 
It's not just to sit, take a seat, but it's to go out and to be evangelizers, to bring others to Christ by our way of life. And we're all called to do that, every single one of us. Just as Jesus transformed those disciples into believers, he transforms you into believers. He's asking you to be an evangelizer. He's asking you to bring other people to Christ. That's true of all of us. The entire body of Christ is to do that. The disciples will be the evangelizers. Why? Because they have drunk of the wine of the Spirit that consecrates them at the wedding. Do you remember at Pentecost Sunday what happened? The people, they were preaching and evangelizing the people. And what do the people say? They're drunk on wine. Yes, they are drunk on the wine of the Holy Spirit. So see in that wine the strength of God's Spirit. And that's to be for each one of us. If in our marriages, if in our congregations, we lose the strength of the wine of the Spirit, we're back to water. And we need to be transformed. And so you and I are called to that kind of a transformation. We see this beautifully, I think, in Paul's letter to the Corinthians today, do we not? What is he talking about? The gifts of the Spirit. You have drunk of the wine of the Spirit. Now use your gifts. So the gifts of the Spirit, we see, they are poured out onto everyone who is a member of the church. Yes, every single one of you are not simply individuals, but you are individuals who received God's gift of the Spirit. It's up to you now to take that gift and bring it to others so that they may be transformed, just as you have been transformed by the wine of the Spirit. All of us are called to do the same. We can't take this... We can't look at this as something, you know, it's a nice little story that I hear about, you know, or it's in the gospel. It's so beautiful, nice. No, it's us. We are called to that, you and I, to be those people who are drunk with the Holy Spirit so that we, too, can go out and evangelize and be witnesses of Christ, bring others to the Lord by our way of life. You, every one of you has gifts. And if you don't know what they are, you should have a, you should have a, a, a call the gifted uh, workshop here and find out what your gifts are so that you can use whatever your particular gift. And it's different for everybody. I understand that. But take your gift and use it. Use it to build up this kingdom of God, this congregation, this body of Christ. That's the only way you grow. That's the only way that the church is transformed by these gifts. Paul saw that clearly. And that's why he gives us that letter, that sec, uh, the first letter to the Corinthians today in, the, in, in our readings to show us how we are to take the gifts that God has given to us and to give those gifts back. So it's never about, yes, every one of you has individual gifts. But they're not just for you. They are meant for the good of all. To build up the kingdom of God. To build up this community. To build up this church. To build up this body of Christ. That's why you got it. Not, they're not for yourself only. They are for the common good. And that's what Paul is telling us. In his second reading today. You see, the wedding feast of the church is really a feast of transformation. All who were there were transformed. Now it's up to us to be transformed, you and I together. The water was transformed into the wine. Christ was transformed into the bridegroom. He's the bridegroom of the church. That's his title. And you read on to other Places in the New Testament. And he says this. Why should we fast 
when the bridegroom is still with you, Christ is with you. Don't fast, drink on that wine. Get drunk on it. Know that it's the Spirit's movement in you. That's what's important. The disciples were transformed. They become believers. They become the future evangelizers. They are the ones who bring people to Christ. You and I, too, are transformed. We are transformed into the friendship of Christ. We are friends of Christ. Read John's Gospel. I call you friends. You are not slaves. So relate to God in an intimate way. As a friend that's been transformed. That's what God wants of you. That's what Jesus calls you to. So Jesus saved the best for last. The best wine. The wine of the Spirit. And he's given it to each one of us for our transformation as well. So I say to you, welcome to the wedding feast of the church. Welcome to the transformation that the Spirit is calling each one of us to do. My prayer for each one of you today, before it becomes a half hour, my prayer for you today is that we will always, each one of us, always remain faithful to Christ the bridegroom. And that we, you and I, will always be his intimate disciples. God bless you all. Amen. Amen.